So, we're going to start with the Middle East in Bible prophecy. I, the idea is to start with a foundation of why it's important to study Bible prophecy to begin with. That's what we did in the first session. Now, once we understand the importance of the study of Bible prophecy, and we understand the importance of connecting the dots of today's events with the Bible, now we can take a look at the center of events in Bible prophecy. The Middle East in Bible prophecy. And um, just so you know, the, 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 the term Middle East is not in the Bible. In fact, um, it wasn't anywhere until the late 1800s when the Brits first coined that name. And then the Americans in their paperwork for their um, foreign policy in that region used that British term and called it um, Middle East. The Middle East, if you look at the map, can we put the map over there? You can see it's roughly area that is in between um, Libya and Egypt on this side and above Turkey and going all the way to Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf States, Yemen, and Jordan, of course, and Syria. So this is more or less that part of the world um, where it all started. Now, a lot of people are mistakenly looking into Iraq as the place of the Garden of Eden. And the reason why, they say, well, the Bible says in the Garden of Eden was Euphrates and the Tigris, and Iraq has the Euphrates and the Tigris. Thus, this is it. Well, it's not exactly it, and I tell you why. Before the flood, everything was different. Everything was different. Continents were all one. God created the ocean, and God created the land, and there were rivers in it. And the rivers had names. But remember, came the flood and the sons of Noah got to get out of the ark. And we already know that everything was different. And when they came and named places, they named them after what they remembered from before the flood. Just like British came to America and called Manhattan in that area, what? New what? York. York is a British term. British name. But before New York, what was the name? Do you know? It's the Dutch who came there first. And they called New York New Amsterdam. Now you would think that there, there's enough names you can use. But why would you? Because they, they use that which they remember. That which they were connected to. That which they are attached to. So the term Tigris and the Euphrates in the post-flood world must have been taken from what they remembered prior to the flood. And, um, and then, of course, ever since after the flood, we are confined into that part of the world to see great things that happen. The Middle East. Amazing. We see from the very beginning of the ancient times the fall of humanity. We know that in Genesis 3, we already see the rebellion of man. God gave us everything. Everything. There was no disease, and there was no death, and there was no tears, and there was no sadness. There was enough food. Men had dominion over the animals. I could tell the lion to come over here and sit down and give me his, uh, you know, whatever. I can do whatever I want. I mean, men was the crown jewel of God's creation. And yet, the only thing, and God, you know, in a way it was a test. The only thing that God told them to stay away from, in order to see that they are indeed following him in spirit and in truth, is stay away from that tree, from the fruit of that tree. You've got a full garden. You've got everything in it. But no. The only very one thing that they were not supposed to touch, they did. And that's what I call rebellion. Rebellion is the root of everything. 
And the rebellion brought later on, in chapter 4, murder. Chapter 4 is the next generation of Adam and Eve, they're already killing each other. And it's interesting because it's the first murder recorded in history when Cain murdered Abel, if you remember. And then you get to the point where in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, it's the saddest, uh, I think the saddest verse in the whole Bible. I'll start with with verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's men. Look from being the crown jewel of creation, the rebellion, and the sin that was injected into that world by Satan. Look what happened. Now, everything that men think of all day long is evil. And then we come to verse 6, which is a horrible verse. And the Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and that He was grieved in, he was grieved in His heart. God grieved in His heart. Jesus grieved over Jerusalem, if you remember that. You only grieve over someone you love. Over something that is dear to you. Something or someone that disappointed you. And, 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 and the, not only that he was grieved in his heart, the Bible says, he said, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I I have created from the face of the earth, both man and the beast, creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Oh my goodness. It was probably so bad that it got to that point where he said, "I'm, I'm sorry, I made them. But then comes the essence of the beauty and the mercies of God. But Noah, of all the earth, he found someone that was righteous. He said, okay, I think I'll give it one more shot. But Noah, but Noah, the Bible says, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wow. So we see in Genesis 6, wickedness all across the world of the time pre-flood world. And then after, even after the flood, in chapter 11, we see people that come together in what I describe as satanic worship. Because only Satan wants to get all the way to God and replace God. And these people in the city of Babel, Babel, which by the way in Hebrew, from the word confusion, Babel, and they want to come and reach God, and and the thing that they say is, they say, let us make a name for ourselves, let's leave God out, let's make a name for ourselves, this is by the way the essence of the world today, let us make a name for ourselves, or let's take selfie or whatever, no, just joking. So you see, it started with rebellion, goes to murder, goes to great wickedness, and goes to satanic style of worship. And now, welcome to the Middle East. Welcome to that part of the world. Look at that map. Uh, The map, Mesopotamia, the area between the rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, or is where Abraham came from, down there all the way up to Turkey, to Haran, and all the way down to Canaan. This is the area where it all started. Interesting. It's very interesting that the way God is dealing with Adam and Eve will foreshadow the future of Israel. He promised to them blessings, seed, and land inheritance. Very interesting. 
In Genesis 9.1, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He's giving them land, he's giving them seed, and he's giving them blessings. And the same goes in Genesis 17. God is reviving His plans through Abraham, giving Him blessings, seed, and land, which are the three components that appear in the Abrahamic covenant as well. In Deuteronomy 1.8, He says, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. Isn't that interesting? And he didn't say, and if you're not going to behave, I will take it away from you forever. Look at Luke 1, 30-33. The angel came and said to Mary, Mary, do not be afraid. Now, I can imagine Mary. She freaked out. This is a, an engaged woman, alone in the room, and suddenly an angel appears and says, Listen, lady, you're pregnant. I never slept with him. Well, uh, I have news for you. You're pregnant, and it's from the Holy Spirit. And I have news for you. I will also give you his name. So I'm thinking to myself, Mary was shocked, but guess how Joseph took it. He comes back from work, honey, I'm pregnant, and I know the name of the baby already. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name in Hebrew, what? Yeshua. Why? For he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him, what? The throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. For how long? And of his kingdom there will be no... It's not limited. Forever there is no end. So in the midst of this terrible, chaotic, rebellious part of the world, God appears and revives His covenant. The original one that He started with Adam and Eve and does it through the descendants of Abraham and makes sure that when Christ is born, He is not changing anything. He continues in the same mantle forever. And ever. A lot of people are saying, we, the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims, we believe in the same God. And I always tell them, really? Well, in that case, my God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you tell that about yours? You know where they will stop? At Abraham. That's it. After Abraham, they, they have their own thing. Ishmael and whatever. But no. The name of God is Abraham. The God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And in some places, like in the prayer of Elijah and Mount Carmel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, he says. The other name of Jacob. The minute the Muslims will say that they believe in the God of Israel, I will be very happy. And God said, regarding the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that I will bless he who blessed you, and I will curse the one who cursed you. And indeed, looking back in history, all the enemies of Israel have been either cursed, destroyed, or at least vanished from the face of the earth. Hosea chapter 9 says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. And that always stuck in my mind. Israel like the fig tree. And and when Israel was religious, Jesus rebuked that fig tree. 
But then in, in, in Matthew 24, in verse 32, when Jesus described in the Olivet Discourse the future events prior to his return, he says, now learn this parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. The restoration of Israel is the most amazing sign of the soon return of Jesus. But what is the focus of Bible prophecy to begin with? When we talk about the Middle East in Bible prophecy, what's the focus of Bible prophecy? What is the first ever prophecy given in the whole Bible? The first was Genesis 3.15. When God speaks to the serpent. Interesting how he speaks to the serpent way before he addresses Adam and Eve. And once the prophecy about him being judged and destroyed and killed by the seed of the woman. Once that prophecy had been set forth, the beginning of its fulfillment became the next act. Satan was immediately placed on the defense. And from Genesis 3.15 and on, for the next 4,000 years onward, the enemy has tried to finish an impossible task, which is what? To cut off the seed of the... Now, last time I checked, and I'm not a doctor. Last time I checked, women don't have seed. Men have seed. Women have eggs. Hello? 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 Okay, so but that's the seed of the woman. It speaks of that who will come forth from the woman without the intervention of men. That's why it's the seed, but of the woman, not the seed of the man. And there's only one place in our Bible that we see that a virgin had conceived. Which is where? Isaiah 7. A virgin had conceived. So definitely the seed of the woman is the Messiah. And definitely Satan, who is not God, does have, he doesn't have any clue when the Messiah is about to come. All he knows is this. I have to get rid of the seed of the woman. I don't know who he is. I don't know when. And when he comes, and when I know who he is, I'll try to get rid of him. But until then, I have to guess. And the enemy tried to stop the Messiah from coming forth, and he failed. And once he failed, and Messiah did come, he then says, if I can't beat them, I'll join them. And he infiltrated into the church. Unfortunately, we see that. But before that, he needed to understand, how can I attack them? Look, I have a question. What did Cain do to Abel? He killed him. What did Abel did to Cain? Nothing. But in the mind of Satan, if I look at this, the thing that came out of the woman's womb, and I see one guy that God loves his offering, and one guy that God is not listening to, I'll kill that guy. (laughs) I'll enter into the other one's heart, and boom. And I'm done. The seed of the woman is over. Nope. Seth was born. And what did Pharaoh, why did Pharaoh try to do to all the male Hebrews when Moses was born? Remember, God forbid Moses will come to the world. And Moses did. And what did Haman try to do to the Jews in the time of Queen Esther, if not kill them all? What did they do to him? Nothing. What did Herod try to do to all the Hebrew males a few years after Jesus was born, just to make sure that he will not grow up to become the king? Nothing. They didn't. I mean, it's amazing. And until today, the enemy is trying to oppress, suppress, and ultimately attempt to eradicate the nation of Israel. However, once again, he will fail. During World War II, one of every three Jews were killed. According to the Bible, specifically in Zechariah 13, yet another holocaust is in the horizon. Both Joel chapter 3 and Matthew 25 speaks of the day that 
The Messiah comes back and all the nations of the world will gather before him and he will judge them according to how they treated the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, and the land of Israel. And the judgment of God is not just a, a hurricane, tornado. It's complete destruction. Remember, I was, on, I was on the Twin Towers the night before they were destroyed. I asked my friend, pastor friend of Calvary Chapel of, of um, um, Old Bridge, New Jersey. I said, what's going to happen to these buildings if something's going to hit them? Because I remember eight years earlier, somebody tried to bring those down through the parking lot. There was a big bomb that exploded in the parking lot of those buildings. But they never came down. And I thought, probably he's going to try and hit them from the air this time. And he told me that um, the buildings were designed, once get hit, to collapse like a stack of cards. Not to fall to the right or to the left. Wow. And I thought, that's cool. I had no idea that the next morning, and I needed to convince the FBI that I had no idea that the next morning it is going to happen. Because they questioned me. Because I spoke that weekend in another church in Bangor, Maine, about this whole thing. And they just heard that I asked that question. And somebody took the tape and ran to the police station with it. If you're planning on doing that, tell me in advance. Complete destruction did not happen to America, but a wake-up call was given to America. So people, if you think that that was the judgment of God over America, no. Three buildings are not the judgment of God. It's the mercies of God. If you think about what was supposed to happen that day, and I know from intelligence sources that I have what was supposed to happen that day, the death toll should have been almost a hundred times more. Speaking of chemical attacks, speaking of more airplanes supposed to crash in the west coast of America, Speaking of even targeting Air Force One itself. The present situation right now of Israel is a great proof to the act of God of preserving the nation of Israel. So you have to understand, Bible prophecy is all about Israel, the God of Israel, the enemies of Israel, the Messiah of Israel, and what is happening in that part of the world. You understand? 100% of the prophecies in the Bible are concerning that. So, anything that has something to do affecting that which we're talking about has something to do with Bible prophecy. Israel today... And I hate to brag because I know it's not us. I confess it's not us. But today, we have never, ever been better than, than today. Never. In our history as a modern state, Israel never had better economy, never had lower unemployment, never had better security. And you would think, wait a minute, I thought the whole Middle East is in flames. Maybe around us. But we have the best time. Come on. The people told me, it's too dangerous to go to Davao. There's mountain and all of that. I said, come on. I had the time of my life there. Guys, let me, let me give you a picture of how well it is. Okay. Okay, first of all, the most essential thing that a nation needs is what? Water. Now, we may not get all the rains that we wish we, did, we would, but look at the water situation in Israel. I want you to see that as far as the water is concerned, Israel is a regional water superpower and it's world leader in water reclamation with 87% of its wastewater undergoing purification and reuse of agriculture. Guys, I was invited to a farm where there's a woman who took me on a tour and she showed me a beautiful pool 
with clear water. And she said, guess how deep it is. And I said, eh, about two, three meters. And she said, nine. And I said, what? She said, yes. And she said, you want to taste the water? I said, yeah. And took a glass of water. I tasted it. It was wonderful. And then she looked at me and she smiled. She said, this is my sewage water from four days ago. <laughs> I'm like about to puke. And then she, and she said, wasn't that great? I said, yeah. And she said, look, it's, it, it's not only great, it's just pure. This is pure. It's better than your tap water. And then, and then I said, so how did you do it? She said, well, I came up with a new system where all the sewage uh, is going into a pool and I put water plants. And they start absorbing all what we call waste. For them, it's food. And then move to another pool. The next level of purification. And to another pool. And it's not even requiring electricity because it's gravity. The water comes lower and lower and lower. By the fourth pool, you can drink it. Wow. Unbelievable. If that's not enough, energy. Over the last four years, look how many gas fields we found off the coast of Israel in the Mediterranean. Trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. When the Russians heard that, they almost choked. You know, they are the largest exporters of natural gas in the world. And look, not only that we found it, we started striking deals with Europe, providing under the water of the Mediterranean a pipe all the way to Europe to lessen the dependence of Europe on Russian gas. Well, no wonder why the Russians suddenly had the urge to help Syria. <laughs> Do you really think they help Syria? If anything, they're using Syria. If that's not enough, out of 365 a day, days a year, 340 are sunshine in Israel. So look what we have. The world's highest solar tower with tons of solar panels. And we, pro we just get energy. Israel, by the way, regarding water, we, we have a company that manages to um, extract water from the air. Yes. Now, that's a little tricky because if you sneeze and I extract it, oh, never mind. What about food? You're a nation of a lot of farmland and farmers. Take a look. While farm workers made up only 3.7% of the workforce, Israel produced 95% of its own food requirement. Unbelievable. The only thing we import is dried mango from, from Cebu. I think. <laughs> what about Israeli cow? You know, Israel export, exported to the world Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot, you know her? Okay, so we have the Wonder Cows. Israel cows are super cows. We have the most productive cows on planet Earth. Did you know that? Our cow is more productive than the Dutch, the German, the American, any, any cow around the world. Every moo is computerized. What about military? Israel rated number one in the Middle East. And if I may say, Israel has the most technologically advanced military on earth. This is from January of last year. Five big reasons why Israel is a mini military superpower. We have types of weapons that I'm, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to even tell you. Because you will feel, oh, why don't we have it? Every, my son... I know if I talk about my son being a soldier in the army, it makes me feel so old. He's a commander already. And he asked me, Dad, what kind of communication system did you have when you were there? And I'm like, you know, I can tell you, but I don't think you have them anymore. He says, well, let me tell you what we have today. And he started telling me, and I'm drooling and drooling. And I said, stop it right there. Okay, you're, you win. Every commander has an iPad. You can control 
the communications and be able to coordinate the actions on the ground with the actions in the sea and the actions in the air. Not only that technological advantage we have, Israel became a cyber security superpower. Look, technological wise, we are the only country in the world where Apple has an R&D center outside of Cupertino and Samsung has an R&D center out of Seoul and, and, and Intel has four different plans and, and Microsoft has another one and even Mercedes-Benz, those Germans, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens in Deutschland. And so, you, you see, think about it. Even they have an amazing center to prepare so why do you think Israel has become so strong, so flourishing? Why? And I tell you something. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 36, it says, And I speak to you, O mountains of Israel, shoot for your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel, for they are about to come. The land of Israel was dead. And God spoke life into it in preparation for the return of the Jewish people. He had to. Mark Twain shows up in the middle of the 1800s and he, sh he wrote a whole journal describing how dead the land was when the Jews are not there. And then comes the Jewish people. And, and not only that they came in small numbers as pioneers in the beginning. And right after the Holocaust, God saved from the horrors of the Holocaust. You can read it in, in, in Ezekiel 37. How God took them out of their graves. And he says, oh, my, oh Israel, you say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves have been cut off. But I tell you, oh my people, I'm going to take you out of your graves. And I will put your feet on your own soil. And you shall live again. And I will breathe life into you. God not only prepared the land for their soon return, and then He took them from their graveyard in Europe, and He said, I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. So God first fulfilled that promise of restoration of the land, then fulfilled the promise of the restoration of the people, and then brought the people physically back to their land. But now we move to chapter 38. And chapter 38 of Ezekiel starts with, Israel is safe, secure, and prosperous. Here we are, 70 years later. We've never been safer. We've never been more prosperous. We've never been more uh, uh, ready. Isaiah, the prophet, says in chapter 17, verse 1, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. It will become a ruinous heap. Interesting, I was thinking about it. Damascus as a city exists almost 3,000 years. It has never been destroyed completely. It has always been damaged but resettled. And We're talking about a point where it won't be able to be settled anymore. And look what's going on. Up to five, six, seven years ago, none of you will even know where Damascus is. People didn't even know where Syria is. Nobody bothered about Syria. And now the whole world knows where it is. The whole world is talking about what's going on there. And two-thirds of Damascus is already destroyed. Israeli official says, if Iran expands in Syria, will even consider bombing Assad's palace. You see, no matter what's going to happen... In, in, in Syria, Israel eventually will have to retaliate and Israel will be blamed for the fall of Damascus. Just so you understand, the, I'll save it for later. So Ezekiel in chapter 38 says there will be a coalition that will come, God will send a hook in their jaw and He will bring them down to the land and they will come and they will plunder and steal and take booty, the Bible says. And He gives the names of those nations, the biblical names 
of Rosh and Meshek and Tuval and Gomer and Togarma and Persia and, 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 and then he says Put and Kush. And these are all Russia, Iran and Turkey on this side and Sudan and Libya on this side. And it's interesting because for the first time in the history of planet Earth, Russia, Iran and Turkey collaborate and form an alliance. And under any other circumstance, they will never be together. Iran is Shiite and Turkey is Sunni. And Russia can't stand both of them. But, hey, it's an opportunity. There's chaos in Syria. There's a civil war there. Let's hop into that territory and use it as our playground to fulfill our very wishes. And tell the world that we are there to take care of the Syrians. But in reality, the Russians came to take care of their interest of gas and oil. The Iranians came to start spreading the Shiite Islam and to station themselves closer to Israel because they believe they have to destroy Israel. It's a religious conviction in order to hasten the coming of the Mahdi in their mind. You have to understand, the Iranian regime is not little rocket men. Little rocket men... The North Korean guy. <laughs> Listen, this guy, you can laugh at him as much as you want. But this guy, as long as you promise him that you won't attack him, he won't do anything. Because all that he cares is survival. He's afraid that any deal is a deal to actually take him out. So he's afraid of that. But he has no religious conviction that he has to destroy anyone. It's completely different. When you come to nuclear weapon in the hands of the Ayatollahs, that's a different story. They believe they have to use it. Not to survive, but to further the kingdom of Allah by destroying Satan, Israel. So the Iranians wants to destroy Israel. The Russians wants to take our oil and gas, and the Turks, they wanted a chance to settle their account with the Kurds, and they also want to show the world that they are the true Sunni Muslims, not Saudi, and not Jordan, and not Egypt. We were the caliphate up until the 1914. We were the uh, Ottoman Empire, the seat of the caliphate, we are the true Sunni Muslims and we will go and do that we need to do as true, devout Muslims. So you see, everyone has his own agenda. But they don't even know that 2,800 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel already knew that they are about to come, form a coalition, and come up against who? Against safe, secure, and prosperous Israel. And that's now. We've never been safer, more secure, and more prosperous. Up until five years ago, they could only come and plunder falafel and hummus. <laughs> now, there's a lot to take. And Ezekiel doesn't mention America. Sorry, America, our biggest ally. We love America. But America is not coming to help Israel in Ezekiel 38. No nation comes to help Israel. And people used to come and ask me, why do you think America is not mentioned? How come we're not in the Bible? We want to be in the Bible. Okay, stop it. <laughs> cool down. Sometimes you don't want to be mentioned in the Bible. Ask Jeroboam. Listen. <laughs> Listen. What are the options for America not to be there for Israel in a very immediate war. What are the options? One, financial collapse. Two, war. Three, natural disaster. All these three are nice. I mean, bad, but not nice. But I mean... It can happen, but I, I, I just don't see how the whole country collapses from being a superpower. But then there's another scenario which I kind of like to think that it would be the reason why America is no longer there. Think about it. If 
the rapture took place today in the Middle East, what government would be gone? What, what government system will collapse in the Middle East? No one. In fact, no one will even know that there was a rapture. Oh, there's a rapture? Okay, in Europe, the rapture takes place right now. No one. I mean, there's of, co- of course, there's several Christians around there, especially Filipinos, by the way. <laughs> but that's it. The only country I know, at least now in, under this current regime, that so many of their most important figures in the most important positions are either Christians or surrounded by Christians, is the United States. And should the rapture take place tomorrow, that country is not going to be a superpower anymore. And Israel is the last thing that they're going to think of. Trust me, if it was not for the evangelicals in America, I don't think America would be on Israel's side anymore. Even the Jews in America are so liberal that Israel for them is a pain. I'm not joking. Hitler killed three generations. One, physically. Second one, spiritually. And mentally, those who survived were mental cases. And third, spiritually. There are sons and grandsons who thought, we want to always take the side of the underdog. And we want to... To accept everyone and everything and every way of life and every, every form of, of, of marriage and every form of family and every form of race and color and, and everything, lest we will be held as, you know, racist and whatever. And, and that which happened to their grandfathers or grandmothers is now causing them to be on the side of accepting everything. So I believe the rapture could be the right next thing. I believe that, and, 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 and I'll tell you why in a few minutes, because you're going to see how Europe is already ready for the rise of the Antichrist. And once he rises, and I believe from Europe, as Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 says, we know that we're out of here anyway. There will be a great tribulation. Described in Zechariah. And Jeremiah describes it not just as a tribulation. He says, alas, for that day is great so that no one is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. God is saying in his word that the last seven years are the years that his attention is back in Israel. And there will be so much, so much devastation. It's going to be Jacob's trouble. Not just the world's, but Jacob's trouble. That's when we know two-thirds of Israel will perish. But then he says, they shall be saved out of it. You know, I often think, how come the Jews will first accept the Antichrist and then reject the Antichrist? You know, that's going to happen. They will accept him when he will offer peace and allow them to build a temple. And then they will reject him when he will go into the temple and demand to be worshipped as God. And then I was reminded, the same reason they rejected Jesus, they are going to reject the Antichrist. Why? They had no problem with Jesus being the Messiah. They had a problem with Jesus being God. This is the blasphemy they accused him for. That's why they wanted him dead. Not for being the Messiah. They believe Messiah can come. That will be great. Come. We'll, we'll usher your entrance. That will be great. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let's dance. But you say that you and the Father are one? I'm sorry. Not in our school. And isn't that interesting? The Antichrist will show up, offer peace, prosperity, free worship, temple, they'll be amazed. Now, this is the Messiah. And then, three and a half years later, he walks into that temple and says, guys, update. I am God. And what is it that they say? I'm sorry. 
You could be the Messiah, but you cannot be God. And they will turn away and he will persecute them. And that is exactly what Revelation 12 is all about. That the women that gave birth to the child is running to the desert to flee from the horses. And how long will she be there? Twelve. Remember, it gives us the exact number of days that describes three and a half biblical years. Which is the last part of the seven years of the tribulation. Amazing. And then Jesus is coming back. He is not coming back to Manila. He is not coming back to the new Jerusalem in Davao. He is not going to rub shoulders with Apollo Kiboloi. Jesus is coming back and his feet are standing on Mount of? And Mount of Olives, by the way, just so you know, according to the European and by the way, most of the world's interpretation is Palestinian. Yes. They say he's Palestinian. That's why the Palestinians are convinced that Jesus is a Palestinian. <laughs> and he's going to come and stand with his feet on Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives is split. But Jesus said one thing to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you will not see me again. Until what? Until you say... Baruch, say, Baruch, Haba, Beshem, Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will invite me to come. You will understand that it's me. You will look at me whom you've pierced. And you will mourn. And you will cry. And you will repent. And you will understand I am your Messiah and you are my people. And you will be saved, as Romans 11 says, and all Israel will be saved. The Bible says that the Messiah will come in His second coming and gather the Jewish people from Bosra, from where, where Petra is today, where they fled from the horrors of the Antichrist. I can't wait. I wish you could come with me, not only to Israel, but to Petra, where I could show you where is a possible place for Israel to hide. And, and I don't know if you know that, but I met Jordanians who said to me, we are preparing a place for you. <laughs> there are Jordanians that are convinced that their job right now is already to prepare a place for the coming persecution of the Jews by the Antichrist. Because the Bible says they will flee to that part, to Moab. Wow. Just as Micah says, he's coming to gather them. And Revelation 12 and Zechariah 14, when his feet are standing on Mount of Olives. And then we will reign with him through the millennial kingdom, as Isaiah 19 says. And during that time, only when Jesus reigns in Jerusalem, there will be true reconciliation between Jews and Arabs. Think about it. Egypt and Assyria will have highway to Israel, according to Isaiah 19. Reconciliation is possible only when God is on the throne. Not the UN and not any government. When God is on the throne, that's when we are going to see. So, as you can see, the Middle East is definitely ready. It has the prime spot in Bible prophecy. But as we are going to learn in the next session... Even other parts of the world are ready for the next move of God in the Middle East and in the rest of the world. Father, we thank you so much that once again we could look into your word and see the sovereignty of our Lord. See that we are in great hands knowing that you are a God that is faithful to your promises. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness towards Israel, and we thank you that it can serve as a great reminder of your faithfulness to, towards all of us. We bless your name this morning from the heart of Manila, from the Philippines, and we, we thank you in the name of Yeshua. And all of God's people say, 
Amen. Amen. Listen, you really want to stay for the next one. I know that you want to... The next one is fascinating because we're going to look at two things. We're going to look both at Europe and how it's ready for the rise of the Antichrist and at how I feel the Philippines has a role in, in Bible prophecy. Okay? All right.